If you look at the map of the United States today, and you look to the west of the state of Georgia, you see the states of Alabama and Mississippi. But if you looked at the map of the United States in the 1780s, you'd see that Georgia officially stretched all the way west to the Mississippi River. Georgia, like many other eastern states, had extensive western land claims. And a lot of the business of the federal government in the 1780s and the 1790s was convincing the western, convincing the eastern states to hand over their western territories so that new territories and states could be created. Usually the eastern states wanted the land claims which they had granted in those western territories to various people, various economic actors. They wanted those land claims to be recognized. And so often the federal government would cut deals with the eastern states, buying them out, making promises to recognize land claims, and so on. That whole huge territory, officially part of Georgia, stretching west of the Mississippi, was known as the Yazoo Country after one of the rivers, the Yazoo River. This territory was one of the last western territories to be claimed by an eastern state. Georgia resisted handing it over to the federal government. And it did so in part because time after time, legislators in the Georgia State Assembly would cut sweetheart deals with outside land investment companies. They'd sell off huge chunks of that territory for very low prices, and they would usually get a bribe out of it for themselves. The most notorious occasion on which this happened was in 1794, when the Great Yazoo land fraud was perpetrated. Four companies came into Milledgeville, Georgia, the state capital. They spread around probably $500,000. And they also paid an official price of another $500,000 to the state of Georgia. In return, they got 40 million acres, almost all of present-day Alabama and Mississippi, at a ridiculously low price. Now, when they heard about this, the citizens of Georgia were furious. In the upcoming state legislative election, they threw out virtually all of the legislators who voted for the Yazoo scam and they passed a new set of laws in which the sale was officially overturned. And the original act of sale was burned at high noon in the city square of Milledgeville. So the sale happens in 1794. In 1795, Georgia says it's overturned the sale. But the four land companies were not sure. In fact, they were counting on their allies in the federal government to make sure that the sale was held up before law as a valid transaction. And just to make it harder to unwind the whole set of economic exchanges, they began to print their own bonds, their own shares in the land held by their companies, and to sell those documents on financial markets in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Pretty soon, thousands of ordinary citizens in those, in those cities and in the surrounding areas officially own pieces of land in what is today Alabama and Mississippi. Now you might wonder why people in those parts of the country would be so eager to own land that had never been settled by Europeans and their descendants and land to which the title was unclear. And the reason why they wanted to do that was because everybody understood that those parts of the United States would be settled by slave labor, and they would be turned into plantations. And in the 1700s, plantations and slave labor were the route to wealth in the Atlantic world. So that's what investors were buying. They were buying shares in the future plantation-generated wealth of slave states. So how are the developments I just described analogous to the terrarium I talked about earlier? You know, the description of an environment in which one organism goes into a spiral of runaway growth and consumes all of the resources it needs for its own survival, leading to collapse. Well, we could perhaps say that because the Yazoo fraud, and in general, the kinds of creative destruction that were possible because of the development of new financial markets linking the United States together, because of that, slavery could expand. And slavery was perhaps unsustainable as an economic system. 
maybe it was unsustainable. We'll talk about that more later, and we'll debate about it too. But what's pretty clear is that development, the expansion of slavery south and west and Alabama and Mississippi and other places, ultimately leads to the Civil War, which certainly was a kind of collapse. But I think we could also say that when creative destruction in financial markets becomes more profitable, entrepreneurs are going to be tempted to use fraud to make their profits. As frauds accumulate, the risk of a broader collapse, a collapse bigger than the collapse of one scheme or one firm, becomes more and more possible. And you saw this repeatedly in the Northeastern financial markets between 1790 and the 1810s. Again and again, bubbles, speculations would collapse. And many people, not just the entrepreneurs who started those kinds of enterprises, but those who had invested in them, would lose their fortunes. So for them, the 1790s and early 1800s are a very, very rocky roller coaster ride. The Yazoo shareholders wanted their money back, and it was now the federal government that was responsible for paying them. They sued in federal court to get payment. And by 1814, the case had made its way to the Supreme Court. And that's when the great Chief Justice John Marshall, also a Virginia slaveholder, made his ruling in the case of Fletcher versus Peck. And in it, he ruled that even though, allegedly, the Yazoo case uh, began with a situation in which a state legislature had sold land against the best interests of its citizens and had sold land extremely ridiculously cheaply and had sold land because they were getting bribes. Even so, this was still a legally executed contract. It was a contract by made, made by people who had the power to make it, the state legislators. And so, as a contract, it stood inviolable. Now, if you want to talk about the development of freedom for entrepreneurs, their ability to buy and sell and make economic decisions outside of old traditions, like, for instance, the tradition that legislatures should have made decisions against the best interests of their people. Here's a clear case. This opens up the entire United States in some ways for creative destruction to happen. But here's something else it did. It also represents John Marshall and the Yazoo bondholders concurring that slavery is legal and slavery is implied by the constitutional structure of American law because slavery too was a kind of contract. When somebody bought a slave, they were entering into a contract. And even someone who had inher inherited a slave was in a sense the heir of a much earlier contract, purchasing and selling a human being. So if you made contracts superior to everything, you were also making slavery potentially legal forever.